Nancy and Bess are visiting Ned at his college, which is a bad idea. Every time they go there, someone dies or runs an illegal gambling scheme. I'm not saying Nancy causes crime wherever she goes, but they might want to think about banning her from campus. Argo Funk Book Review, Argo Funk Book Review. Ned's newest frat brother is Parker Wright, who makes an instant love connection with Bess. He's so distracted by her, he forgets he has a psychology study group tonight. Wayne Perkins, the angry teaching assistant, practically drags Parker away for their meeting. I don't know why Wayne's so angry, because the study group doesn't involve actual studying. Parker sits in a chair and listens to music for an hour, while Wayne observes him from behind a one-way mirror. The music contains secret instructions and subliminal messages to improve your grades. Something like this. La, la, Study la, harder. La, 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 Get good la, grades. La, 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 like this video la, la, and subscribe la, 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 to the Funk Reads YouTube la, la, channel. La, la. Another frat member is Mari, the computer nerd. Just for fun, he had a computer analyze everyone's relationships. The computer says Nancy and Ned are the most compatible couple ever. Really? Because only last year, Nancy and Ned cheated on each other in back-to-back -back books. I'm still mad they never talked to each other about that. Nancy and her friends are passing by when Wayne is shot and killed in the study room. Parker stumbles out in a daze. He's so badly shocked, he can't remember anything that just happened. Parker is arrested by Lieutenant Easterling, a gruff, no-nonsense cop who dislikes teen detectives. Parker's let out of jail the next morning. He confesses he once got into a fist fight with the victim, and he later has a violent confrontation with the victim's boss, Professor Edberg. Oh, and the gun? Parker's dad gave it to him as a present? He carries it with him at all times. Only he forgot about it until just now. If I was Bess, I would seriously consider dating someone else. Nancy's only suspects are a bald man who is seen nearby, and a study group member named Diana DeMarco. Diana's roommate is chatty about Wayne. Once Nancy mentions Diana, the roommate gets mad, kicks Nancy out of the room, and files an official complaint with campus security. Yeesh. Nancy and Bess pose as reporters when questioning Professor Edberg. He's excited about his subliminal message experiment. If he can prove the tapes work, he's going to make millions of dollars, along with his business partner, Larry Boyd. Nancy visits Larry's business. It appears to be moderately successful for a company with under five employees. I'm just surprised he started a big tape-selling business without knowing if the tapes work or not. You'd think testing your product would be the first order of business, not the last. Research shows Larry Boyd has a shady past as an unlicensed hypnotherapist. He forged signatures and even went to jail for five years for murder. Murderers are set free after five years? That's bad news for Nancy because this series is seven years old, and there are a lot of murderers who would like revenge on her. The frat has a big meeting to discuss Parker's situation. No joke, they unanimously decide to throw a house party tomorrow. I don't know why I expected Ned and the frat boys to take things more seriously. Nancy breaks into Wayne's house to look for evidence. She finds Diana doing the exact same thing. Diana confesses she was dating Wayne, which is against school rules. Diana accidentally drops two computer diskettes. They're password protected. You can tell this book is from 1993 because Mari has to explain to Nancy what a computer password is. He explains it twice because passwords are definitely high-tech computer information that most people don't know about. Diana tries to leave the state without telling anyone. Nancy stops her at the airport. Diana confesses she's a corporate spy from a rival subliminal tapes company. She posed as a student to intercept the results of the experiment. The culprit hypnotized Parker to go into a trance whenever he hears the song Cosmic Mind Control. I don't know if it's smart or stupid for the culprit, 
to use a song called Mind Control for literal mind control. Nancy and the others figure out this hypnosis trick when the song is played at the frat party. Larry's identified as the bald man from the murder scene. I guess he normally wears a wig. Larry refuses to explain why he was at the crime scene, and he calls the police on Nancy because she is harassing him. Nancy is so nosy, I'm surprised that doesn't happen to her more often. Diana and Mari work together to figure out Wayne's computer password. Wayne's files show he discovered the tape experiment was a failure, he was killed to cover it up. A third computer disc shows Parker was hypnotized, which we kind of already knew, but now that it's confirmed, the campus doctor is able to hypnotize Parker using the song. He makes Parker relive the night of the murder. Parker says the culprit played the mind control song and ordered him to kill Wayne. When Parker resisted the commands, the culprit stole the gun and shot Wayne himself. Multiple times, Nancy asks who the culprit is, but Parker refuses to give a name. Parker insists on calling the culprit he. Maybe Parker was hypnotized into playing the pronoun game. Nancy correctly guesses the culprit is Professor Edberg. Nancy approaches Professor Edberg, pretending she wants a payoff in exchange for keeping quiet. Ned and Parker secretly record the whole conversation, and they provide a helpful distraction when Edberg tries to kill Nancy. Edberg is arrested, and Parker decides he likes Bess so much, he invites her to go on vacation with him in the next book. It should be a murder-free trip, but I don't know! Better bring Nancy and Ned along just in case. The end. Post-book follow-up. This is the fourth book in a row where Nancy has defeated the culprit with a karate kick. I'm not a fan of this repetition, but I do like it better than the earlier part of the series, where Nancy kept forgetting she's a karate expert. I thought Parker was too unpleasant of a character. Nancy gets frustrated with him because he keeps making things harder for her. This does not mesh well with the subplot of Parker being a legitimate love interest for Bess. I'm not sure about the hypnosis stuff, it's far-fetched. Parker listens to music, and that's enough to bring him to the brink of murder. If these subliminal tape messages are that effective, then why is the culprit trying to cover up the fact that they don't work? They worked just fine on Parker! I wonder if this book was originally intended for the younger readers Nancy Drew series, as it lacks the usual danger and violence. If this was one of the Nancy Drew video games, people would complain there aren't enough death scenes. Overall, it's a typical entry in the series, the setting is fine and so are the characters, I didn't buy the hypnosis stuff, and a week later, nothing about this book stood out in my memory. I give Nancy Drew Files number 81, Power of Suggestion, a 4 out of 10.